en realidad la necesidad de la fusión eh, a partir de los hermanitos del Buen Pastor que nos hicieron esta llamada para poder unirse a la Orden de San Juan de Dios. I think originally, uh, when I first suggested the possibility to my brothers, the brothers of the Good Shepherd, there was a great deal of apprehension and opposition. Well, it's a process, and I think I'm becoming more and more comfortable with it. Lots of concern, because we were venturing forward into the unknown. Well, originally I was not certain whether this was going to be a good thing or a bad thing for the Brothers of the Good Shepherd. Um, and so not knowing uh, what this fusion meant, um, th there was opposition. Also, it's the whole challenge of being a small group of men who knows everybody, joining an international order of almost 1,300 brothers who speak a variety of languages, who live religious life and live ministry in various cultures throughout the world, and how we would fit in. I feel a little anxious at times, but uh, my general feeling is more a sense of hopefulness for a good future and the ability to be able to continue the mission of Brother Matthias uh, with the very brothers that he began his religious life with. I think it's a beautiful idea. Again, we have Matthias now in heaven. I believe that he had probably asked the Lord Let's do something with the brothers because we know we get smaller and smaller. I think those of us who were a part of the, the process from the beginning felt it was, it was a grace that was being offered to us because uh, the Good Shepherd were very close to uh, the way in which St. John of God himself had lived hospitality uh, on the streets of Granada. And I think we've realized that um, in joining with the Hospitaller Order, um, we're not sacrificing our identity, we're embellishing it. I was pleased to hear though, during our talks uh, as we started this fusion process, that we would be able to continue our ministry as we do today. Uh, at that point it gave me great relief and, and I was on board from that moment on. We're um, um, appreciating it and we're respecting our history um, because in truth um, the hospitalers and ourselves are very similar. Y personalmente pienso que el hermano Matías Vares estará muy orgulloso y muy contento el día que los hermanos vuelvan a casa donde él fue miembro de esa casa, parte de la familia de San Juan de Dios. Creo que va a ser un momento muy importante tanto para ellos y que el hermano Matías Vares desde el cielo seguro que apoyará este proceso de fusión. John Kiyudad, later to be known simply as John of God, was born on Green Street in Montemor Onova, Portugal on March 8, 1495. Leaving home before his 10th birthday, he lived as a shepherd in Oropesa in Spain before becoming a soldier in the Spanish army. In 1538, following his second military engagement, he returned to Gibraltar, where he became a bookseller. John of God, when he started his mission and ministry, he was, he was marginalized. He'd been without going into too much detail. Uh, he was on his own in, in the worst possible sense because he had lost he had no family or friends or money, uh, no resources. Uh, he had nothing, he had no place. He just the street. And that's a very low point from which to start. Maurice Patrick Barrett, later to be simply known as Brother Matthias, was born in a modest cottage on Yellow Road in Waterford, Ireland on March 15, 1900. At the age of 14, he announced to his mother that he intended to join a community of brothers. Following a series of delays and compromises prompted by his mother, Maurice, now at the age of 16, finally boarded a Dublin-bound train on March 17, 1916, to join the Order of the Brothers of John of God. Matthias was a man who was keenly concerned about the plight of the poor and the needy, and so I think that's what encouraged him to follow in the footsteps of John of God. On his 16th birthday, he went there. So as a very young man, he learned 
he learned to live and walk and think and talk like John of God, and that was instilled in him. He was he was he was completely completely overwhelmed by the by the mission of the, of the John of God brothers. John of God never joined a religious order, but was inspired by a religious upbringing. He made a living by selling religious books, traveling from town to town, and collecting firewood that he would exchange for overnight accommodation. Eventually, in 1538, John arrived in Granada, Spain, a port city that served as a gateway to the colonies. Granada was very populous and had a variety of social problems associated with crime, prostitution, disease, poverty, and homelessness. Paradójicamente, eh, Juan de Dios inicia su labor en la ciudad de Granada, en una ciudad que en el tiempo en el que Juan de Dios re, la recorre es, está, es una ciudad llena de esplendor, pero que a la vez está generando importantes eh, bolsas de pobreza, importantes necesidades sociales. Juan de Dios, en medio de esa abundancia aparente, es capaz de detectar esas necesidades y de dar una respuesta puntualmente a cada una de ellas. In 1920, Matthias was sent from Ireland to France for further nursing and religious training. Bound by the vow of obedience, he accepted a transfer to Montreal and on April 14, 1927, sailed into Canada with brothers Laurent and Hilary. In 1934, he was appointed provincial superior of the newly established province of the John of God Brothers, and in 14 eventful years, he established five institutions, a refuge serving the needs of 200 men, a hospital with 500 beds, a soup kitchen, a home for epileptics, and a convalescent home for 75 patients. In 1941, Matthias arrived in Los Angeles, clothed in a threadbare black clerical suit and shod in old oversized shoes with loose soles that flapped. He carried only a small cardboard suitcase. And true to form, he spent the next nine years establishing hospitals, nursing homes, and night shelters in and around Boston and Los Angeles. When he had the vision to bring the order into the United States, when he went to um, Los Angeles and, and on to Boston, he was a mover and a shaker and, and uh, a dynamo. It's simply a matter that he, he was emphasizing um, a uh, particular aspect of, uh, I suppose, our, our charism of hospitality and uh, the emphasis that he placed on the homeless and the disabled, the mentally ill, uh, people that were in distress, uh, the addic and people with addictions. In 1539, John of God dedicated himself to a radical Christian manner of living after hearing a sermon preached by St. John of Avila in Granada. His life at that time was very disturbed and he was admitted to the Royal Hospital for the Insane where his treatment for a mental illness was to be stripped, shackled, whipped, and starved. Time in a mental hospital gave John of God a sense of purpose. He accepted the beatings as atonement for his past sins. He objected openly about the severe treatment of others and espoused a more therapeutic approach, such as washing, feeding, and treating them like human beings. Desde su experiencia, después de la conversión, que expresa claramente la esencia de nuestro carisma cuando viendo el trato que le dan a, a los pobres, a los enfermos del hospital real cuando él está allí ingresado también tiene la misma experiencia que tienen aquellos enfermos y él exclama ¿Quién me diera un hospital donde poder tratar a estos pobres, mis hermanos y prójimos como se merecen? Y a partir de ahí él sale con la decisión de iniciar el camino de la hospitalidad. Strengthened by his vow of hospitality, much like John of God, Brother Matthias responded to the needs of the poor and suffering with total energy and abandon. In fact, Matthias was expanding the order much quicker than he could communicate progress to his brothers across the Atlantic. And during that time there were two world wars. The communications were appalling uh, because uh, again, even to travel, it, it took six or several weeks to get from uh, Ireland, say, to Canada or America. Uh, my understanding is that Matthias um, ran into trouble with the superiors at the time. 
and particularly around uh, governance issues. Uh, he wasn't complying with what was the standard policies and practices uh, around governance and also uh, in the manner in which he was recruiting and uh, training and forming uh, new entrants to the order uh, in the United States. And that's where uh, the conflict between what he felt called to uh, inside of himself and what the order at that point in time stood for, or the way it, 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 it understood its mission. And it's all very controlled. If he were with them today and wanted to branch out and do different ministries that serve the poor, he would be greatly supported by them. Soon there would be complaints within the order about Matthias's administrative style and even questions about his obedience. In July of 1949, Matthias was called back to the psychiatric hospital in Still Organ, Ireland, where he had joined the order as a teenager some 33 years before. It caused him a great deal of pain to be put back to folding laundry in the same room he'd been in when he was 16 years old. And while he tried his best to be obedient, Matthias felt that there may have been questions about his mental health. Confusion and misunderstanding eventually led to Matthias's release from former vows. In September of 1950, he left the Hospitaller Order of St. John of God to assist a priest, Father Gerald Fitzgerald, in the Jemez Mountains of New Mexico in running a center for priests experiencing a variety of problems. What he was doing in Boston was essential to him and to the poor of that large city and his soup kitchen efforts, I thought, were very effective and wonderful. But he apparently was seen, to use a military phrase, as a loose cannon. It was very, I imagine, very painful for him. And in a sense, he never left the order of St. John of God because he always brought St. John of God with him. Humility is a great um, virtue, but to be forced through those circumstances was unfortunate for a man of his talent. Following his release from a mental hospital, John of God undertook spiritual and medical training before returning to Granada. His compassion for the poor was so deep that he often exchanged clothing with anyone whose apparel was filthy and tattered. A local bishop suggested John wear simple clothing purchased for him so that he would no longer exchange it with the poor, being aware that John would meet many people who would be repulsed by the clothing he wore and the smell of it. Nearly 500 years later, Brother Matthias exuded the spirit and emulated the lifestyle of John of God in strikingly similar ways. Shortly after arriving in New Mexico, he was asked by the Archbishop of Santa Fe to respond to an immediate need in nearby Albuquerque and to start a religious group of his own. Then, on January 19, 1951, the Congregation of the Little Brothers of the Good Shepherd was established and there began the continued journey of John's road to hospitality. Matthias was very, very reluctant ever to talk about the fact that he was dispensed from his vows. None of God's name was mentioned at the table. He would, he would just, he would just, uh, you would see a tear or two because he would, I don't think you ever get John of God out of, St. John of God out of his heart, of his heart, not of his mind. Uh, and all the hospitality that the Brothers of the Good Shepherd uh, experienced over the years came from him. Siempre creo que se sintió como hermano de San Juan de Dios y murió como hermano de San Juan de Dios, aunque fundó la, la, la congregación de los hermanitos del buen pastor. Por eso no me extraña que vuelva a casa. Sleeping rough without a home in Granada, a wealthy and kind man known as Don Miguel Aviz Venegas allowed John to sleep in the entranceway of his house. Not comfortable leaving his poor and sick to sleep in the streets, John brought them in to sleep at the entranceway of the Venegas house until there were so many that Don Miguel felt it was best for them to relocate. Eventually, John established a house of hospitality on Calle Lucina, which would be his first hospital at Granada, supported by charitable women and through begging. He was a very active man. When he came to Granada, the city se volcó con him. Precisamente no al principio, porque al principio lo consideraba un hombre raro, extraño. Pero en cuanto empezó a ejercer su ministerio, la gente se volcó con él, le ayudó en todo lo que necesitaba 
In Albuquerque, Matthias quickly responded to the needs of the community with hot meals and a place for men to clean off the road dust and lay their heads at night. A ladies' auxiliary and a men's advisory board was formed, and more men came into the ranks to help grow the order to other parts of the United States, as well as in Hamilton, Toronto, Great Britain, Ireland, and Haiti. Hospitality was being extended to those in the care of Brother Matthias and the Brothers of the Good Shepherd, inspiring others to follow. I joined the Brothers of the Good Shepherd while I was there. Uh, the auxiliary and I've been a member ever since which is going to 44, 45 years. He said to me, you know, we just need to have something for the homeless women. We have nothing for the women. And that was when we started the show. You were drawn in uh, to his to his personality. Just There was just, he had a presence about him, but it was a holiness that was unfailingly present. First time I met Matthias is a week after my 32nd birthday. I decided to become a brother. And he grabs my hand. That's the first time I felt so holy. I said, wow. It was like seeing a grand canna. I was standing in awe at the presence of this guy, Christ like. When I first met him, I, I, I just felt that I was talking to a saint. And as I lived with him, as months went on, I lived with him, I, 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 I in my own heart and my own mind, I knew that he was a saintly man that did saintly things. When my daughter died in 1984, um, uh, Don was my attorney at the time, and he told Brother Matthias that Denise had died. Didn't tell Brother Matthias what happened, and Matthias's remark was, well, I need his address, I've got to write him a letter, he's got to get it tomorrow. Well, we got it. But he also said to Don and myself that he had talked to my daughter and she didn't mean to do it and she was okay, she was tired. And he did not know she'd taken an overdose of aspirin. Uh, he later came to the funeral uh, and he came to the house and sat there and he sat and told my wife, don't worry, she's in heaven, she's gonna help me get there. I guess you could say in many ways, he's been in my life through his brothers, through his prayers, and um, he's just been a wonderful man. He still is, and they always talk about, he's gonna be a saint one day, Saint Brother Matthias. There was never a, a requirement of uh, a person had to be a Christian, or uh, they had to sit down and listen to some um, proselytizing. That was never a part of the picture. The only requirement presented was need, like the parable of the, uh, of the um, Good Samaritan. In Granada, John of God's reputation grew, and the work he was doing gained the support and donations of the surrounding area. Those in need knew where to find him for care and support. For the sick that could not come on their own, John often carried them on his back from the streets to the hospital. Soon, John had to relocate to a second larger hospital with the help of wealthy supporters who, despite John's past reputation as a dubious character attracting the riffraff of the city, they still had confidence in his ability and conviction. Ya, el propio fundador, San Juan de Dios, en una de sus cartas que él escribió, de las poquitas que escribió, él decía, ¿no? en esta casa se reciben personas necesitadas de todo tipo. ¿Mm? Personas sin techo, peregrinos, enfermos, niños, en fin, eh, mujeres maltratadas por la vida, de todo tipo, ¿no? Y en ese sentido es lo que la orden realiza. John of God died on his 55th birthday in 1550, worn out with his labors of charity. He was canonized in 1690 and became the patron saint of the sick, the dying, and of nurses. While John never entered a religious order, his works continued after his death with the establishment of the Order of St. John of God, which operates hospitals and other related health care and social services in 52 countries around the world. In August of 1990, Brother Matthias died in his 91st year. Throughout his life, Matthias lived the charism of hospitality, emulating the life of St. John of God. Matthias and John of God were both men of great vision. 
and in spite of their individual problems, they had a wonderful and beautiful dependence on God. They both had the courage of their convictions to take up the work they thought God called them to do, and they fought for it, and they both suffered for it. And we're coming to brother, together as brothers to ensure that the poor, sick, and needy people will continue to be cared for in the future in the way shown us by uh, Matthias and John of God. And that's why we're doing it. And that's why, you know, if it's painful for, for some at times, just to remember that the people, we're, the people we're trying to serve are suffering even more and have given up even more than we are asked to do, so that we do it willingly. On January 19th, 2015, the Little Brothers of the Good Shepherd fused with the Hospitaller Brothers of St. John of God. The fusion of the two religious orders saw the end of the Little Brothers of the Good Shepherd as a formal entity. The Little Brothers of the Good Shepherd have now become Hospitaller Brothers of St. John of God. The charism and work of Brother Matthias, who followed in the footsteps of John of God, will continue through the newly established Hospitaller Province of the Good Shepherd of North America. What we want to guarantee, insofar as we can, is that hospitality, that great gift that God has given, that that stays and stays in the, as a part of the ministry of the Church. And that's why we, we, we the, the, the Good Shepherds and ourselves are coming together to ensure that that happens to a great extent in North America. That the process of the fusion has been uh, a challenging one for the brothers and uh, it will mean many different things for us as we move forward. But I think for the staff, in many ways, it will uh, only strengthen the ministries that uh, Brother Matthias created and the brothers built over the years. And it will, in fact, give us a, a greater sense of belonging to a worldwide organization. Los hermanitos eh, han trabajado específicamente en este campo del servicio a las personas sin hogar, a las personas, eh, digamos, de la calle, a personas eh, con necesidades, digámoslo así, más de tipo social. ¿no? Y yo creo que esto es una, una gran aportación para la orden y específicamente en esta parte de esta parte del mundo, Canadá, en América, en América del Norte, etc. The Good Shepherd brothers and their co-workers, the family of the Good Shepherd, will be encouraged to know that the dream will continue uh, of Matthias, that it's not going to die when the brothers then die, and uh, the John and God brothers die. <laughs> I think the merger, I hope, is recognition by St. John of God that he was truly one of them. It's been a challenge in terms of how we move forward and what we need to give up or, or die to as we join this new community of St. John of God and what we bring to it. So it's both life-giving, but it also will mean some sacrifices on our part. And I think that the challenge for each and every one of us is to rise that to that occasion because really what we're all here for is to do the work of God, the work that Jesus Christ left us, which is to clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, and to alleviate human suffering. Never knowing where I'm headed 
till we reach the bottom.